you're seated. It's Megan Tiller. I know her. Yay! We flew her in for the VBSC this week. Uh, she, she drove herself, so that's all right. It saved us a little in the budget, so it helped us out a little bit. But Oh, goodness. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. You can make your way there in your electronic digital platform or, of course, in the, uh, the book style. You can use a Bible. I heard they uh, work still, don't they, Steve? There you go. Plus, you have to have a good-sized lap like you and I do. So there you go. That helps a little bit. We introduced our series in 1 Corinthians, Love Never Fails, uh, a couple weeks ago. Then last week, we uh, spent a little time with Pastor Brian Calloway um, doing missions on Sunday, number two. That was a sweet time and very thankful for the message about uh, the evidence and what the mission was all about. You covered the book of Acts in about 45 minutes. That was, that's a yeoman's work right there. It takes me 45 minutes to get off the first verse, so that was really, really good. But uh, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians for a little while, and we are starting chapter number one, but we did introduce the, uh, the series, as I said, two Sundays ago. And Missions on Sunday really uh, was good because it, reminded us of what we have the privilege and honor of doing, which is to do missions as a church. And um, we are in the middle of VBSC, Blue Springs. It starts up tomorrow with training day, and Tuesday the campers will be here. We have uh, nearly a couple hundred campers, which is, uh, again, wonderful to have so many people be able to take part. And so we have to move uh, to the mission field. Uh, which is the people's lives and the culture and the community of Blue Springs. Looking forward to that. Then we have VBSC Oaxaca, Mexico, which is two weeks from yesterday. We'll be on a plane, and uh, we will be there, ready to go. And uh, we got a little training today. Uh, we're going to be uh, running today, I think a three-mile run. We're going to do a shuttle run, push-ups. Uh, I'm going to tell you to do it. I'm not going to uh, at all demonstrate. There will be no demonstration but uh, the study time in the Bible is always good. But uh, no, we, we're getting ready to go. We uh, shipped off uh, uh, many hundreds and thousands of dollars of camp equipment. It's down now. Uh, excuse me, making its way down. Uh, shipping is really inexpensive. You know that, right? <laughs> but praise the Lord that God uh, provided the resources to do so. And so that's on its way. Mighty Might starts up this coming weekend. Um, another mission work. It's all for missions and for us as an Acts 1 8 church. When you walk out those double doors every Sunday, there is Acts 1 8. Maybe some of you are going to go, Man, I've been coming here for five years. What are you talking about? It's the little wood placard that is on the back wall. And you're reminded as you head out from our gathering time that we are the church and gathering, but we're also the church on mission together out in the community. And so missions on Sunday keeps everything before you. It reminds us that we have work to do. And we do have an incredible, amazing mission. And God has given us the instruction manual. He's given us the beautiful good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And reminds us, as the church in Corinth had to be reminded, that it is really centered up on charity never faileth, love never fails. With all of that I have listed there and thinking of that, there's always the opportunity for salt and light. There's always the opportunity to be discipled, to go be part of a Sunday group, which is part of our family aspect of missions, family, and sports. And as we think about live faith, love others, and declare hope as the mantra and as the theme song of our mission work from First Bible, we're reminded that we have to get the marching orders once again from the word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 is what we're going to get in here, into here in a moment. We're going to cover the first 17 verses this morning. We're going to just bite off little bits and pieces that the Spirit will lead us. And as we did our review a couple weeks ago, we looked at the theme. And that's, of course, that charity never fails. 
we realize that charity never faileth. In a general sense, the word charity means love, benevolence, goodwill. We looked at the, the, the deeper meaning of it and how that's just, of course, the Noah Webster's Dictionary, but then we go to the Strong's Concordance and we're reminded, I put a couple of these up here for those of you who weren't here a couple weeks ago, that's great. And for those of you who are, it's a good review. I like to do a little bit of review to get us back to where we are headed and to kind of uh, sharpen you back up to, hey, keep you up to speed on, on what we've covered thus far. Charity, strong, G26, it comes from G25, the root, which means love, affection, or benevolence, especially a love feast, to bring that feast in the love and to have that feast be centered in love, charitably, dear, and love. This love that God is telling us, that is mentioned 28 times in your New Testament, is that deep, meaningful love of God. When you Receive Jesus Christ as Savior. When you called on the name of the Lord to save you, you received this love. This is this love that Jesus Christ is praying to the Father about that he would give to those apostles and to all the disciples after him. When it says up there in the next Strong's Concordance definition, in signification, excuse me, in signification, it follows the verb, I don't speak Greek, I barely speak English, as Roger Zink told me. So, Right, Roger? But consequently, it denotes affection, goodwill, again, love, benevolence. We'll look at those few verses here in a moment. When you think again about love never fails, Something's got to stir in you. You got to start thinking for a minute. Is that really Bible? Yes. Is that really from God? Yes. The place and source of the ability you have to love someone else comes when you're born again. You've met a lot of people that are not born again, that love well, that do things like that, but there is no comprehension in any cell of their body and any spirit piece of their life and any of the soulishness of who they are that understands this kind of love. My fear is that many believers don't know this love. I've shared before, I never knew how to love until I got saved. And then after 30-something years of being sanctified a little bit, I'm still learning how to love. I did not know. I thought love was all about me, that I could receive love. I'm very good at receiving love. How about you? You do well with receiving it? Do you know what love looks like? Gimme, gimme, gimme. You know, it's a funny thing, though. Like, we all talk about, oh, grandchildren are better than the children, and all oh, the grandchildren. Well, that's because, as I said to someone yesterday, <laughs> grandchildren think that grandparents are really wonderful, even though we're not. Well, forgive me, you are, but mm, my grandchildren are never going to figure out because they love me unconditionally. Oh, it's so good. But what it does is it caused me to realize I need to love them the same way. I've upset my granddaughter, and I've been more upset at that than just about anything. Because when we see what the Bible has to say about God's love, and we looked at this last week. Let me just read a couple verses out of 1 Corinthians 13. If you want to run over there for a minute, we'll be back in chapter 1. But it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I have become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I had the gift of prophecy and understand all mercies, excuse me, mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. How would you like to go through your life being nothing and yet be a multimillionaire? Have the ability to speak six, seven, eight languages. Be able to tell prophecies in the future to people. But God says you don't have my love. You don't have my agape love. You do not have charity. You are nothing. 
that's an absolute devastating thought for me. I've shared that. It just overwhelms me. I don't want to be a nothing. But this world is convinced that to offset the nothingness because they don't have the love of God through the Lord Jesus Christ, they will fill it with something that they think can take the place of God's love through Jesus. And there's nothing that can take the place of his love. There's nothing on the face of the earth like his love. It's his love that spurred on his move to send his son. It's his love that before the foundations of the world, he slain the lamb of Jesus Christ. It's his love that moved his grace to be able to make a way for you and I. And then when you get saved, you get that love. What are we doing with it? What are you doing with the love that's been bestowed upon you? It's the greatest gift beyond your salvation that you'll ever have. I want more time. I want more money. I want more family. I want more, more. What more could you want than this love that makes you something in him? As I said a couple weeks ago, my love is nothing. But his love is everything. My love will fall on his face, but his love will never fail. And yet, we keep on searching for some other way when he's presented the whole package to us. I'm confused with the human failures in this one area that when you find an answer to something and you know exactly how to do it and this is the way that we then have to undo it to redo it all over again and it comes to salvation in Jesus Christ it comes to discipleship it comes to everything the Bible has it all written down for us we get it we get a handle on it. we go okay let's just go with that oh no let's rewrite it let's restate it let's go away from it What are you saying, Pastor? What do you think happened to the church at Corinth? In 52 AD, the church was started, and by 56, he's writing this letter that they're a mess. Four short years, and they were a mess because they lost track of his love. They lost track of the proper doctrine that he had bestowed upon them. They, They started filling themselves full of themselves. Charity suffers long and is kind and envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Oh, even verse number three, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I have given my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. There's no profit in anything in this world without this love. And this love is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other place. Three verses that were in the definition that we found in Strong's. Greater love, G26, agape love, had no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You want to know how to love somebody? Then grab a hold of that love. Because you will not lay your, ha- your life down for a friend until you have this kind of love. You say, I would just, I would just give up my life for anybody. I, I would just sacrifice anything. I, I would. I, I, huh. Wait to come, push comes to shove. You'll survive and you'll hold on and you'll preserve your own life as long as you can. And it will be rare to find someone that will do exactly this unless they're truly born again and they love Jesus Christ. And they've grown to a place where his love has permeated and covered their whole soul and life. Love. G26, worketh no ill to his neighbor, it says in Romans 13, 10. Therefore, love, G26, is a fulfilling of the law, this agape love, this benevolence love, this charitable love. There is no fear in love. 1 John chapter number 4, verse number 18. G26 tells me, but perfect love, G26, casteth out fear. His love is perfect. It's complete, it's finished, there's nothing to be added, there's nothing to be taken, care, taken away from. The old phrase is very simply is this, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. You know what that fear is? The fear that comes from the first, that per, first part of the verse, because fear hath torment. The torment of what's going to happen to me when I die. What's going to happen to you when you die? That's a way of approaching things. 
where do you pe think people got the idea of asking people that when they want to have maybe a, a kind confrontation and conversation with someone about salvation? But really, could it start with, do you know God loved you so much that he made a way for you and you don't have to work your way into it because Jesus Christ did all the work because he loves you that much? But that person is in fear right now if they're lost. If you're lost this morning, you do not know Jesus Christ as Savior. If you never called upon the name of the Lord to save you, the Bible said, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's a faith move. It's you putting your complete faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It's not saying a prayer only because the prayer will not save. We know that. It's right here and right here. I will declare after I call on the name of the Lord and he changes me and gives me new life. It's a brand new life. I'll stand up in the baptismal take and I'll tell you a story of how I got saved, weren't you, Mike? I'll tell you what happened to me. I'll tell you that I'm born again. I remember different people that have stood up there and said, I now know that I am saved without question. I know for sure because there's something different in me. It's Jesus Christ and his love that came in and changed your whole trajectory, course, and journey. And now you know his love. It's completely in you. Again, what are you doing with it? What are we doing with that love? Again, it's like having the greatest gift and knowing love never fails and realizing that it's so attractive and so beautiful. When someone loves you, when someone shows you that kind of love, think for a minute, real quick. I joked about it earlier. What is it you love about someone loving you the most? Think. Are they forgiving? Are they forbearing? Is that person kind? Is that person caring? Does that person show you love like, like no other? That's someone that you want to be around. Do they have a conditional love, a berating mouth, a hurtful spirit, a mean heart? Are they unforgiving? That's not God's love. That's the carnal flesh of selfishness. It's the rottenness that comes out of me when I want to rear my ugly head and declare that I'm self-righteous, that I'm the Pharisee of Pharisees, that I'm the one that runs the show and everybody has to come to me for the answers. That is a major failure. And the Corinthian church found it out. Four years after they were planted, four years after this man, Paul, who loves like no other in the New Testament, What is attractive to you about God's love? I want you to think about that as we read 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Start with me in verse number 1. You see the title of our message up there. Division is not attractive. We came to that place, I did, we, me, and me, and God just wrestling with this of how this would come out. But today's message is division is not attractive because... When we see God's love, we find it to be attractive. But the first thing that Paul goes after of all the things, they've got problems with servanthood, immorality. They've got problems with men and women in the church. They've got problems and difficulties with theologically dealing with spiritual gifts, stewardship, even the resurrection. They don't know how to do the Lord's Supper right. They're perverting things and perverting things. And like many Christians today, the Corinthian believers, they had a great difficulty in not mimicking the unbelievers. And that corrupt society, remember, the Corinth society, the Corinthian people, they were in the midst of a devilish, devilish city. I think many Christians themselves are still in danger of desiring all the security and blessings of things that come with salvation, but yet still would like to have some of the things of the old life. I fear that that is 
of course, a duplication of today that's even from there. In fact, it's really clear that oftentimes this new life in Christ brings us great security and great blessings, yet we still try to hold on to this world's junk, the world's stuff, instead of operating in the world as a light and salt and saying, okay, I'm going to operate, but I'm going to pursue Jesus Christ, not operate with a little of Jesus that I'm going to pursue the world's stuff. The pleasures and ideologies of this world, they're going to come and go. We know that. And I'm so thankful for his love to show me that. And so as we get into chapter 1, we're going to be seeing that Paul says, whoa, you need to stop being so divisive. Divisions is the first thing he deals with in his letter which is to me very interesting with all the other things that we're going to get into. Follow along with me, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. Remember, he was part of the crew in Acts chapter number 18 in Corinth, a Jewish man that was operating in the synagogue. You can see that he ended up taking position, and then he now was a brother in Christ, which means he got saved as well. Of course, he got beaten and beat up as we look in the accounting in Acts 18. Now he's mentioning him, Paul is, in his letter to the Corinthians. Verse number 2 says, as he really brings accolades to this church, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus our Lord, Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, Paul's not being very harsh. Yeah, he's being very kind so far. He's being very nice. <laughs> he really is. Let's continue with his nice words, verse number four. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom ye were called into, unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. First nine verses, wow, he's very nice. I thought Paul was really rough in the church of Corinth. Well, I used this illustration before. It's kind of like you as a dad or a mom or as a leader or someone who's a mentor or a teacher. You call somebody aside and you know you're going to have to talk to them about something they've done wrong. But before you do, they say, oh, you are, you, you are such a good son. You're such a good daughter. Thank you for blessing me. Your mom and I are so thankful for you. You are God's gift to us. In fact, I, I couldn't have thought of a better daughter. And the, your daughter's going... Your son's going, what is coming after me next? They're getting ready to just bombard me. No, 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 I mean that. I, I really just, we love you and you're such a precious gift. From Mom, dad, get to the point. Here comes the point, verse number 10. Here he goes. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. That there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. You see the word same, speak the same thing. Use the same mind and the same judgment. Be perfectly joined together. We'll get to that here in a minute. Verse number 11. He says, hey, watch out for the divisions that are among you. Verse number 11. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. So in verse number 11, excuse me, verse number 10, he's mentioning division. Verse number 11, he's mentioning contentions. Things are going to get rough. Now you're talking to your son or daughter and saying, I tell you what, if you ever put the... And you start talking really rough and so kind of harsh, and it's getting harsh. He says in verse number 12, now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or... Were ye baptized in the name of Paul? Great questions right there. Scathing. Scathing questions. I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Verse number 17. For Christ sent me not 
to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. Think of what's being said here in this accounting. The highlighted words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. We'll finish this message up in a few minutes right on that verse. Consider the statement, love never fails. Consider that Paul, again, is bringing the same statement to them in this letter, though yet, and of course it's coming later in the letter, though he starts out nice and speaks of them, I thank God for you, uh, I'm so glad that you are doing what you've done, you are a bunch of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're waiting on the coming for Jesus, I, I see so much in you, but... Let's consider this. John, Jesus Christ in John's gospel said this simple statement in his last words and prayer that I brought to you two weeks ago in an introduction. Verse number 26, John 17 says, And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. That's at the core of everything he's writing in the Spirit. He's saying, I want you to grab a handle on the love of God in your life so that you will get beyond what you're in. But you are in a mess. You started, the, the church got started, God blessed, and now there's divisions. Now there's this division. And these divisions, when we use that title, when you think about the statement, you say, okay, divisions are not attractive. When's the last time you went looking for a divided team? When's the last time you said, I love to join up for the team that has the most dissension and most difficulties in it? How many, anybody sign up for that? Uh Uh-uh. Can I please find a church that's constantly fighting and arguing with each other? That's where I'd like to join. Are you crazy? No, I'd like to come to a church and possibly do that to somebody. Oh, 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 oh. No, no, no. No, no, no. We don't start out that way. We don't start out as a divisive person, especially since we're born again, we're new in Christ, we have this new life in Christ, we're new creatures, we have never had this incredible life that now we have, and now it's attractive. Division's not attractive, but unity, of course, is attractive. God's love is such an attraction to people, but it's the proper type of attraction. It's, It's so attractive. And I think about what Paul's communicating here in just these first few verses that we're, commu- uh, that we're covering today. And I'm thinking, why did he choose? Now, I know it's God, eh? but why is it in his input or how this comes out and he's writing it and he's writing it down in his personality and his thinking and all that he's done. He's in Ephesus. He had the church planted. He's now writing this letter back from there. I'm thinking, Wow. He's got to deal with this? Well, he better. You don't stand by and just say, okay, your church isn't very attractive anymore. You don't have that love that Jesus prayed for us that we would have. That love wherewith thou hast loved me, God. I want them to have it. That's what Jesus prayed to the Father. And yet, there is this division over every matter. And as he starts this out, he's saying, How did you get to the place of such arrogance and such pride? How did you get to the place where you have a lack of forgiveness? There's division. And it comes from deception and disruption. It comes from that constantly discontented spirit. As Warren Wearsby says in his Bible study commentary, he describes this church as being defiled, divided, and disgraced. And as we look into this study, it's not me going there and say, oh, pastor, does that mean this is the way you feel about the church? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. God has led me to this study as we looked at it, and I said two weeks ago, live faith, love others. There could have been many different book studies next, but God led me to this study. Why? Because this church needed this love 
of God to be at the core root of all that they were going to get on in mission. And you see in the second letter how they're getting a handle on ministry. They're getting a handle on giving. They're getting a handle on many things, yet they still have struggles, as any church does. And I look at our church today, and I'm saying to myself, after 2,000 years later, we can still cycle through all these same things, get so cranked up on so many other things, and forget that at the core of all of it, Love never fails. Division is not attractive. I would love for people to say, I love being at that church. I love for you to say, as you look around the room or interact in ministry, I love serving the Lord. We have over 50 people signed up to be part of VBSC. I'm so thankful for that. That's attractive. Why? Because it's love. Division is not attractive. Division is not something that we love to see. So today, for just the next few minutes, I won't take long, I'm just going to hit you with five mini lessons that confirm that on the other side, that division's not attractive, that God's love is what does the work, and he's communicating it through the message in the scriptures here. The first one is this out of the first three verses. As saints in Christ, we ought to be sanctified unto God. You say, okay, that sounds good, Pastor. Well, it's right here in the Bible. Verse number two, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. We are sanctified. We are set apart. We are saints. When you see the word saints, it's very, very simple. It's one that's set apart for God, by God. It's not the old thinking and the old theological way of some of the religions that say, hey, you have, to be, you have to die and you have to have done a miracle or two, then you can be a saint. That is not what the scriptures teach. It is not some type of thing where now that I'm called a saint, I can walk around and tell everybody, yeah, I hope that you can rise to my spirituality level. I am the saint of all saints. That's not it either. When you're set apart and called to be an apostle, Paul understood this. But also, too, Paul wasn't one of the original 12, so how did he speak of it? He spoke of it humbly. He wanted to make sure that he wasn't part of that false teaching stuff of those people that were coming in and causing the division. Paul was a man that people wanted to be around that were believers. The believers wanted to be around them. But guess what? He had his failures as well. He had his problems as well. Think about Adam and Eve and how they were beguiled and self-willed, but God still used them. Noah drank himself into a drunken stupor, and then sin came from that. David, Thomas, Peter. Do I need to continue? The Bible is filled with those that are in God by faith, and God counted them righteous, and yet... They failed in some areas. They needed God to continue to sanctify them as saints. I think that we see that and we go, wow, it means we're sanctified, yes, when you're born again. So we're set apart unto God. It says up in the, up in the screen there, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, excuse me, chapter number 6, verse number 11. The same word, sanctified, in the meaning, and here he is writing it a little letter, a little later in this letter. We'll cover this in a few weeks. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. You know what the list is before that? You were a thief, a coveter, a drunkard, a reviler, an extortioner. You cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You were a deceiver, a fornicator, an idolater, an adulterer, an effeminate, no abusers of themselves. But yet he says you are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified. That's it. Now that's his love. His love did that for you. You now, believer, have that love to live in. Would you and I choose that love, please? How am I going to do that? You need to get in a little bit deeper with him. You need to test him and try him. It's okay to try God. He doesn't mind. Look in the scriptures. There's a few that tried him. Daniel comes to mind from that song. He put it before God. You give me the interpretation. 
He went to him in prayer. Joseph, who did he put to the test? He tried God and God proved himself. And on and on it goes. Paul did it. Jesus himself proved his father. And yet we won't prove God in his love. Prove it. He will come out showing you he loves you. It may take some time. There's some places around the corner where you go, God, how could you possibly love me and let that happen to me? How can you possibly ignore my plight? I love you. This world's filled with some wickedness. And there are times where I intervene. There are times where I do not. But I know that when I got saved, I was washed, justified, I'm sanctified, I'm born again, I'm new, and now I have his love, and it's totally life-changing. The second little mini lesson out of this is our testimony of Christ sought, excuse me, ought to be confirmed by the saints. You notice that I'm using this little, little phrase, as saints, we ought to be sanctified unto God every day. You got born again, you're saved, and that sanctification, that's that salvation sanctification. Now, the daily make me holy sanctification, that's something that you have to give God permission and prove him to do so. The second one of this is our testimony of Christ ought to be confirmed by the saints. Where do you see that, Pastor? Look at verse number 5, 6, 7, 8. Look at this thing here. When you see... I thank God always on your behalf for the grace of God. Verse number five, that in everything you're enriched. You're sanctified in him, you're enriched in him. That's pretty good. Verse number six tells me, even in the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So you've already got a sanctification piece, you've got an enriching piece, you've got an expectation of Jesus Christ coming back, you've got this confirmation of, look it says in verse number seven, so they come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got that expectation in the confirmation. You then have this dependence upon who? Verse number nine, God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son. Look at all that we are in as a saint. You're set apart unto God. The Greek word refers to something offered to God no matter what its past history is or what you previously have done wrong. It's one who belongs to God. It's washed Move in that love. Live in that love. It never fails. I'm bogged down. Then you don't know God as much as you can. You have the option, pass or play. And this isn't a game. So you can pass or you can get in and say, okay, God, I need to do some hard work, but you're going to do the best work. Yes. I turned Peter's life around even though he denied me three times. Is that okay? I showed you how to do relationships with Paul, but Paul and John Mark couldn't even get along. I showed you his love, didn't I? Demas forsook Paul, and yet, (laughs) in the very end of things, Paul was still faithful. Paul's still faithful. I think of this testimony of Christ, it ought to be confirmed by the saints. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, continuing with this theme of Paul writing to the church at Corinth, now he which established us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is of God. So this confirmed statement, this confirmation is the same word established us with you, in, excuse me, established us with you in Christ and hath anointed us of God and God. Verse 22, who hath also sealed us, given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. It's a whole other message right there in that passage of Scripture. That meaning of the word very simply and confirm is to establish, to make sure of, to stabilitate. You need stability in the word? Yes. Will that overcome this world's craziness? Yes. Will you know that his love never fails? Yes. Now, whether you're going to trust that or not, it's your choice. The third little mini lesson comes out of verses 10 through 12. As brethren in church, we ought to be joined in Jesus Christ. Now, let's bring this a little bit more home. We need to be joined together. Verse number 10 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, I spoke of it earlier, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be, now say it out loud with me, perfectly joined together. Say it again, perfectly joined together. One more time, perfectly joined together. Perfectly means nothing can be added to it. 
It means it's completely fulfilled. It's finished. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing is sweeter than the body of Christ being perfectly joined together in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the body of Christ, and actually living there. When we do that together, everybody, it is really awesome. I love watching that. I love being part of it. I love stepping back and going, I can see God has simply, perfectly joined us together in Jesus so that we speak the same thing, we have the same mind, we have the same judgment. The remedy for discord, if we could just get that right there, the remedy that we would have then would lay the foundation for dealing with all the other sins. You think about that. These six things that the Lord hate, we can go right on. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soareth discord among the brethren. Paul says, hey, let me ask you some questions in verse number 11 and 12. I hear from the house of Chloe that there's contentious in verse number 12. He says, hey, what's going on here? I hear that some of you are saying I'm of Paul, of Apollos, of Cephas, and of Christ. What is that all about? You people that say you're of Christ, you're just the self-righteous people that say I'm the best Christian. I'm just a self-righteous Galatians Christian. I'm of Christ. No one's better than me. And then all of you, some of you saying, I'm a Paul. Cephas, you know that's Peter. Oh, Pete, he gets thrown into the mess because he's come through and done some teaching too, so I want to be baptized by Peter. They're using a very profound but yet simple piece of the believer's walk in going to be baptized and causing a division that's so unattractive that those four people, Bobby, would you please stand up? Dwayne, would you please stand up? Brian, would you please stand up? Randy, would you please stand up? Now, how many of you like them better than you like me as a pastor? Where's Steve Bryles? Where's Steve? Hey, Steve, get over here! Hey, Josh! It should never even be a question that comes up. Go ahead and sit down there. It should never even be a matter. I love what you bring to the table. I love what you bring to the table. I love what each leader brings. Thank you, God, for the pastors of this church. Thank you, God, that you anoint someone like me. And here we are in the midst of the church at Corinth, starting in 52 AD, with a man named Paul who stayed there for 18 months, named the leadership, put everything in place, and then gets a word from the house of Chloe that they're in a bunch of messes because they're divided over things. How unattractive is that? The believers that are in there, they don't want to be part of that. New believers, why would they come there? Brethren, we ought to be joined in Jesus Christ. It says up there in 2 Corinthians, I believe, chapter number 12, chapter number 13, finally, brethren, farewell, be perfect, there it is, be perfect, of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. That's his closing in his second letter, still writing the same things to them that he wrote in the first letter. Because it's important. Why else? God obviously made sure that was written there. Finally, brother, and farewell, be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Well, let me just read this again. Verse number 10, perfectly joined together. Those three words together in the meaning, when you look it up in your concordance, come up with that word perfect in that context right there. I didn't write it, God did. And when I read that, I'm going, oh, wow, are you kidding me? You know what he says just before that? Therefore I write these things being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness according to the power of the Lord, which the Lord had given me to edification and not destruction. I want to be a part of doing edification, even though I still hear some grumblings and difficulties and strife and quarrels. I still want to edify you. That's a man of love. That's a man that knows charity never faileth, love never fails. 
It can never fail. It's God's love. My love will fail. My love falls apart. My love dries up. My love has conditions. My love loves to behaviorally modify people. If you do something, I'll love you more. That's an easy way to love. If you don't do it, I don't have to love you. What? That's the gospel according to this world. You love whenever you feel like it. You care whenever you want to. And if someone doesn't love you, you cry out, scream and holler and hurt people. God, forgive us. Forgive us believers for not doing what we need to do. We need to live in this kind of love. This is the powerful message of this man Paul preaching and teaching to this church at Corinth before it destroys itself. Oh God, oh God, forgive us. Fourth of five, here it is, last two. Fourth mini lesson about divisions that are not attractive. Our contentions ought to be halted because of Jesus Christ. Not because of anything else, though other things and other factors can halt your contentions. But this is the key. This is the core. In fact, this is what stops all contention. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have a love one for another. It stops the contention. Greater love hath no man than this, that he laid out his life for his friend. We say these verses and we speak them like they're an afterthought. They should be a mantra and a motto and a way of life. It should be my way of living, my conversation piece that I love completely. That's what I want in my life. I want more of that. Because it will cover the multitude of sins. It will edify. Knowledge will puff up. But charity edifieth. Is Christ divided? Verse number 13. Was Paul crucified for you, or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? Oh, I got baptized by Dwayne. I learned the Bible from Randy. I like Bobby's preaching better, and I can now go to Brian's class. Whoa, time out. Is Christ divided? This is about Jesus Christ. This is Jesus' church. It's all centered on Jesus Christ. It's centered on him being preeminent. He is the one who's over all. He is the head of the body. He remains that way. He's the chief shepherd. I remind you that all the time. I believe that with every fiber of my being. I do not say it with a tongue in the cheek. I do not say it with a contrary spirit in me. I am completely convicted of all of that, that it means that this is his love and he is not divided. Jesus Christ never brought a divisive word in his life. You say, well, he came to divide and conquer. What did he do? To prove them that were already against him. Because his love was still there for them, that they would receive his sacrifice. That on the cross he said, forgive them for they know not what they do. So every word that he spoke was backed up with his work on the cross. Every single word. You've got to take it in its entirety. The love of Christ cannot be piecemealed out. You need to take it all and say, I see what Paul's saying. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Christmas and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. He just kind of minimized it. He said, yeah, I, I baptized the house of Stephanus, but besides that, I don't know whether I baptized any other. <laughs> I love how he just kind of handled that one. He spoke the truth to it, and he moved on. He moved on. It says up on the screen in first, excuse me, Second Corinthians chapter number twelve. Same statement here when it comes to this contention. Contention means a quarrel. It means debate. It means strife. It means having variance. It says in verse number twenty of Second Corinthians twelve. 
For I fear lest when I come I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not, lest there be debates, envyings, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults, tumults, Verse number 20, and unless when I come again, my God will humble me among you, that I shall bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. He's still dealing with the sin matter with love. He's still saying, I know this is all going to come back up again. I know it's still there, and yet I still love you. For us, church, we need to behoove what contentions can do to us. They ought to be halted because of Jesus. But he was nice to me today, so I'll stop being contentious. So she was nice to me. She used better language with me. How about if you just halt your contention because of Jesus Christ? How about trying that? I've tried it. I can tell you it's 100% successful. Just put your armor down that's your flesh and pick up his armor, which is spirit. The weapons of our warfare are spiritual. Oh, the shield of faith takes care of the fiery darts. The helmet of salvation reminds me that my mind has got to be filled with the mind of Christ out of Philippians chapter number 2. The feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace reminds me that spiritually speaking, I need to bring peace and the good news to other people. And lastly, our lesson in verse number 17, and we're done. As the church, we ought to make, excuse me, we ought not to make Jesus Christ of no effect. <whistles> Follow this very simply. This verse speaks volumes. Verse number 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, he's minimizing that, but to preach the gospel. He's maximizing the preaching of the gospel. He's saying, I didn't do it with wisdom of words, not with wisdom of words, lest, because he th- it's the words, no, it's the power, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. You know how many times your words get in the way of the effectiveness of the cross of Jesus Christ? Our contentions, our divisions, our choices to sin instead of sanctify, our choices of the flesh instead of faith. As a church, we ought not to make Jesus Christ of no effect. Hey, church, let's join in together, as I had in the second one. Let's join together and be perfectly joined together by him. He's the one who can do that. And when that happens a little bit, and I release and let go of my own will, and I turn things over to his will, you've got to stay with it a while. You've got to stay with it for five years, and 10 years, and 20 years, and 30 years, and 30, and 40, and 40, and 50. It gets better and better in Jesus Christ. You actually learn how much he really loves you. And you realize how much He can give you the ability to love him back because you didn't have it. I have not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. That love him. That love him. It says in 2 Corinthians 9 to finish out, And I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting should be in vain. There's that word in vain. It's the same as when we looked at the word no effect. Of none effect is vanity, vexation, a waste of time. Less happily, if they of Macedonia come with me and and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in the same confident boasting. Again, that's a chapter on grace giving. And how they were once in a place of giving of their time, treasure, and talents. But now he's saying, wait a minute. Lest our boasting of you should be in vain. Because maybe they've changed their manner of giving their lives. You see, when it comes down to it, charity never fails. Charity never faileth. Our theme verse. 
But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. When I come to the end here for our invitation, I say this to you. We are called as set-apart people. Believers, we're called as set-apart people who ought to be attractive to others. You should be attractive to other people because of the love that's in you. The love that's in you. Not what you wore, not your wisdom of words, but the love of the Lord. So here's your challenging question. We ask ourselves today, is my testimony attractive to other believers? I didn't even say the lost world. We'll get to that. Paul gets to that later. He deals with this first. Church, how attractive are we to other believers? Please bow for a word of prayer. Now with the amount of people here, before I pray, I want you to consider where you're at, spiritually speaking, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. There's music now playing in the background softly in our invitation song. I just ask you that if you're lost today, you've never called in the name of the Lord, maybe that's you today, you've never gotten saved, you, you've heard church language, you've heard some things about being born again, but you don't know what it means. I'll tell you what, I'm going to be sitting right up here I sit here for a reason. Because one day, a number of years ago, a young lady asked me if I'd come sit with her and tell her how to get saved, and she called on the name of the Lord to save her between services. Her name was Katie Shalon. God broke my heart over that. I'll be up here waiting after service if you want to talk. But you that are believers, ask yourself, and then let God do the work. Is my testimony attractive to other believers? Our Father in heaven, we've had a sweet time. We've taken a bit of time, but it's been worth it to get into your word. Thank you, Jesus, for showing us what love really means. Thank you for Paul the Apostle. He loved his church so much, and he showed it in his words, but he had to speak truth in love. Thank you for our message this morning where you have spoken to me and I know you've spoken to all of us by your spirit. May you have your way in this invitation as we answer this question. What does my testimony look? Is it attractive to other believers? In Jesus' name. Please stand. The music is playing. Nobody will bother you. If you come up here and pray, you will be respected and honored. Please come. Use this area right here to come pray. Come and talk to the Lord about where you're at. Maybe you want to pray right there in your chair. That's fine too. Come and pray.